Welcome to Wireless Fundamentals, Session 11, Connections and Roaming. In this session, we want to discuss WLAN client roaming. We define roaming and talk about why it is important. Then provide an overview of roaming operation and terminology. Then we will discuss different types of roaming and review basic roaming configuration and practical considerations. One great advantage of WLAN solutions is mobility, the ability for users to move freely throughout an environment, untethered by wires. To accommodate this level of end-user freedom, your deployment should provide all coverage areas with a continuous blanket of RF services. This allows clients to seamlessly roam from AP to AP with uninterrupted services and negligible frame loss. The AC in control of the AP that a client initially associates to is called the Home AC, or HA. The client authenticates via this AC, and the AC stores client authentication status and parameters. It synchronizes this info to other ACs in a mobility group. The client then roams to AP3, which is controlled by AC2. AC2 is therefore the foreign AC, or FA. AC1 now perceives the endpoint as a roam out client, while AC2 sees it as a roam in client. If client 1 had roamed to another AP that is controlled by its home controller, this would be called an intra AC roaming event. However, since the client roamed between APs on different ACs, this was an inter-AC roaming event. Any client that supports fast roaming is called a fast roam client. Intra-AC roaming occurs when a client roams between APs controlled by the same AC. The AC maintains all client authentication info and user profiles. This ensures that the AC can distribute this information to its APs as appropriate to accommodate fast roaming. The APs can be managed via the same Layer 2 broadcast domain, or they can be on different Layer 3 subnets. During intra-AC roaming, the client initially associates with AP3, which is connected to AC2. The client walks down the hall, and as the signal from AP3 weakens and that for AP4 gets stronger, the endpoint WNIC makes the decision to deassociate from AP3 and associate to AP4. The AC proactively pushed the client information to AP4 so that when the client requests an association, AP4 does not force a new authentication. The client associates with a very fast handshake operation to complete an intra-AC roam association. Inter-AC roaming occurs when a client roams between APs controlled by different ACs. The ACs synchronize all client authentication and user profile information to ensure seamless roaming. As before, APs can be managed on the same VLAN or on different VLANs. Inter-AC roaming relies on IACTP. This is an HP proprietary protocol that enables ACs to securely communicate via a generic encapsulation and transport mechanism. In this scenario, client 1 initially associates to AP, and so AC1 is its home AC. Client 1 authenticates. The resulting authentication and crypto key information is stored on AC1, which proactively forms a special IACTP tunnel with AC2 to synchronize this information. As the client walks down the hall, the endpoint does an intra AC roam to AP2 as previously described. Continuing to walk, 
the signal from AP2 weakens as AP3 strengthens. The client WNIC decides to disassociate from AP2 and reassociates with AP3. AC2 had client authentication info from AC1, and so the client is not forced to reauthenticate, and a fast inter AC ROM association occurs. When configuring inter AC roaming, you should always be consistent with your configuration of SSIDs. Make sure that ACs are configured with the same SSID name and that the SSIDs are configured for the same authentication methods and encryption modes. The AC must also be configured with the same roaming group. You learned that client authentication information is proactively cached between ACs. This proactive key caching mechanism is only relevant when clients authenticate using the WPA v2 protocol suite, which includes AES encryption. Proactive key caching is not relevant for clients that use the older WPA v1 protocol or are using pre shared keys for authentication. We will discuss these protocols in more detail during our next session on WLAN security. To configure roaming from the AC GUI, navigate to Roam, Roam Group. Enable the IACTP tunnel feature and then specify the source address as the AC's own IP address. Optionally, you can enable authentication and enter an authentication key. ACs must have compatible authentication configuration to do enter AC roaming. In the member list area, click the Add button and enter the IP address of the other AC and click Apply. You can also configure enter AC roaming via CLI, as shown in the example. Layer 2 roaming occurs when you are roaming between APs that map the SSID to the same VLAN. For example, you initially connect to the CORP SSID on AP3. When AP3 receives WLAN frames, it bridges them onto the Ethernet segment with a VLAN tag of 10. Later, the client walks down the hall, roaming away from AP3 and toward AP4. The client associates to the CORP SSID on AP4, which is also configured to forward frames from the CORP SSID on VLAN 10. Layer 2 roaming is sometimes referred to as RF roaming or simple roaming. This is because most APs natively support this feature. APs can easily hand off client session information at Layer 2 with no special solution or configuration required. You must simply configure your AP deployment in a typical but careful way as follows. APs must support the same SSID. Clients cannot change SSIDs seamlessly, so all APs must have consistent SSID configuration. All APs that support the SSID must use the same security configuration, as must the clients that intend to use it. And by definition, all APs must map the SSID to the same Layer 2 subnet or VLAN for Layer 2 roaming to be successful. Layer 3 roaming is sometimes referred to as network roaming and occurs when you are roaming between APs that map the SSID to a different VLAN. For example, you initially connect to the CORP SSID on AP3. When AP3 receives WLAN frames, it bridges them onto the Ethernet segment with a VLAN tag of 10. This means that the client receives an IP address on VLAN 10, such as 10.1.10.5. Later, the client walks down the hall, roaming away from AP3 and toward AP4. The client associates to the CORP SSID on AP4, which is configured to forward frames from the corporate SSID on VLAN 15. This means that the client is now on VLAN 15, the 
10.1.15 subnet, but has a 10.1.10 address. To make this work, AP4 must tunnel the traffic back to the home VLAN. The previous graphic provided a simple overview of how a Layer 3 roaming works, but did not convey a real-world scenario for when and why you would need it. This diagram reveals such a scenario. There is a large campus with multiple buildings. You could use a single VLAN for the Corp SSID. This would certainly make for a nice, simple WLAN, since we could use Layer 2 roaming. However, you probably don't want a single VLAN spanning multiple buildings and support for several hundred users. Large broadcast domain can get saturated and are not scalable. It is a far better network design to keep VLANs local to each building. When users connect to SSID Corp in Building 1, they are mapped to VLAN 10. Users that show up for work in Building 2 are mapped to VLAN 20. Since all other aspects of the SSID configuration is consistent, this is fairly transparent to a typical employee. Other than us network nerds, not many people know or care what VLAN they are on. Of course, if someone from Building 1 needs to seamlessly roam to Building 2, this would require a Layer 3 roam. However, you may find that you don't actually need seamless roaming between buildings. To determine whether your deployment actually needs Layer 3 roaming, first consider the distance between buildings. To have WLAN roaming, you must blanket the areas between buildings with RF coverage. If it is a short walk between buildings, users may actually want to walk between buildings while remaining connected. You might use Layer 3 roaming. However, if it is a long distance between buildings, many users will not care about Layer 3 roaming. They connect in Building 1 and get a 10.1.10 address in VLAN 10. When they're ready to go, they simply close their laptop, hike on over to Building 2, open their laptop, and re-authenticate. There's no need for Layer 3 roaming if that is how your users work. However, you might think, I want Layer 3 roaming anyway. You must consider the cost. To cover a large outdoor area, you might need to install APs outdoors between buildings. You have to run power to those APs. You have to purchase outdoor NEMA rated APs or purchase NEMA enclosures to protect them from the weather. You may need to build structures to mount these APs. After adding up the cost, you might realize that the benefit isn't worth this cost. Do you really need Layer 3 roaming? Analyze usage patterns and cost, weigh the benefits, and make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. When considering roaming operations, remember that it is the client device that makes the decision as to whether to roam and when to do so. This decision is primarily based on signal strength. As AP1 signal gets weaker, AP2 signal gets strong, and the client WNIC decides to roam. Or not. Client endpoints can be the cause of poor roaming performance. For example, many Apple iPad and iPhones and Android devices simply do not roam properly. They seem to have been envisioned as more of a home consumer item as opposed to an enterprise class corporate device. Experiment. If you have a known good roamer, such as a corporate Windows Intel-based laptop, see if it roams properly. If some devices roam just fine on the network, and other devices fail to roam on the same exact network, it is unlikely to be the cause of the network. It is more likely the client. In some scenarios, the WLAN implementation could be at fault. If APs were deployed too far apart, you may lack the minimum 10% overlap needed for good roaming. 15 to 20% overlap is better, especially for finicky applications like voice over IP, 
over WLAN. As AP1's signal gets weaker, there is no other AP around with a significantly strong signal and roaming fails. Conversely, installing APs too close together is also bad. Instead of 15% overlap, perhaps your APs have 40, 60, or even 90% overlap. With so many strong signals around, some client devices can get confused and constantly bounce or churn between three or four APs, never settling on a single best one. If you deploy your network based on solid RF survey results, scientifically pinpointing optimal AP locations, this is very unlikely to occur. If you take deployment shortcuts and simply guess about AP locations, this will most likely occur. All right, now we have a good WLAN system with good client mobility. Let's finish up our discussions with an introduction to security. Session 12 will give you a nice introduction to WLAN security concepts, even showing you how to configure some of the more common client security protocols.